What have I gotten myself into? So, for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look at the Bipbop trilogy of games. Bipbop 1, Bipbop 2, and Bipbop 3. Well, specifically, the one you're watching right now is Bipbop 2, which is likely the game most people are familiar with, as it was released as shareware back in the early 90s, and you'd register to get the first and third games. Now, the reason you start on the second one and not the first will become apparent once I actually start showing the first one, but on the surface, this game here looks basically like a chunky breakout clone with a surprisingly large ball and paddle. However, these three games hold a bit of a dark secret to them, which we're going to see if we can unravel together as we play through them. I do have to warn everyone, though, that the backgrounds in the second and third game occasionally have some rather aggressive palette cycling going on. Now, you should be fine if you're not normally prone to epileptic episodes, as the recommended limit for color flashing, which can be tolerated by almost everyone, is 3 hertz, and the worst these games do is 2 hertz, so 2 flashes a second. But for anyone concerned, I've actually rendered a special format for this video where I've greatly reduced the contrast on the gameplay footage to minimize the effect, the link to which should be right at the top of the video description. The Bitbop games were all created primarily by one Stuart Riffle, going under the business moniker of s and Software, creating the original Bitbop in 1989, and then the two sequels, both in 1993. The two sequels of which can definitely be called Breakout Clones, but the first one... Eh, we'll get back to that. Also, if that guy's name sounds slightly familiar, he actually went on to do work on some recognizable game series, such as a couple Madden games, a few 007 games, and a bunch of Need for Speed titles. Now, as for video and audio, the first of the Bitbop games runs in CGA 320x200 for color graphics, the two sequels run in MCGA 320x200 256 color graphics, and all three games are limited to using the PC speaker for sound effects and music. Now, as for the current release state of these games, this is where things get a bit interesting. Ross Scott of Accursed Farms, known for his Ross's Game Dungeon video series, made an episode of his show covering the Bitbop games back in 2015, and one of the things he was able to do for his video was source the first and third games of the series from Stuart Riffle himself, subsequently getting permission to release them online as freeware. So obtaining the entire trilogy is very doable now and can be done most easily from the DOS Games website at www.dosgames.com. But because Ross was the one who who put him up first, I'd be remiss not to link to his website as a source too, www.accursedfarms.com, since you can still get the first and third games from there as well, though not the second one, since again, Bitbop 2 was shareware and those can be found on practically any website dealing with old shareware titles. Also keep in mind, the first game has always come with the third one, so you typically won't find the first game on its own. So for discussing the gameplay, I'm going to go in order, starting with the very first Bitbop game, which, um... Okay, so the first Bitbop game is like the bare minimum of what you would call a game. You have mostly empty screens, four pixels arranged in a square masquerading as the ball, and a triangular shaped paddle which can never stop moving left or right. Now if you tap the left or right arrow keys, the paddle will start moving in that direction and will bounce when it hits the edges of the screen. The paddle also moves roughly twice as fast as the ball at all times, with the goal of each of the 10 levels of this game simply being to get the ball off the top of the screen. Now, as you're probably noticing right away, the ball can only move in one of four directions, all 45 degree angles. You'd think that, given the nature of the game here, this would predetermine how each level is going to play out to some extent. And indeed, if you can find some level of consistency with the first few actions you take in a level, you can achieve the same results each time. But there's a bit of a catch. The hit detection in this game is best described as, it wants to work, but frequently doesn't. Actually, let me rephrase that. The hit detection can handle solid walls just fine, it's just the paddle it has problems with. Frequently when the ball reaches the paddle, it'll just start passing through and trigger multiple collisions in a row. Most of the time, though, the ball will eventually decide to start moving in an upward direction, and it often feels random whether it bounces as expected or ends up going the opposite direction. Oh, and sometimes the ball does not end up going upward again and ends up just phasing straight through the paddle. 
It doesn't happen often, but often enough that it's exceedingly aggravating. But that's kind of the trick to the game, is that most of the levels can actually be won very quickly, but it requires consistently pulling off, hitting the ball either perfectly, late, or back the way it came, and consistency is something that's really freaking hard to pull off here. Well, I can safely say though that levels 1, 4, and 5 all have a way to beat them on the very first strike of the ball against the paddle. For level 1, you need the ball to hit the paddle as late as possible without setting it back the way it came. For level 4, you need the ball to hit the very tip of the paddle. And for level 5, you actually have to deflect the ball back the way it came immediately. And even then, that last one sometimes doesn't work right given how inconsistent it is pulling off reversal hits. Oh yeah, level 5 has a message for the player scrawled into the level itself saying, Death awaits, beware. Which is kind of our first sign that there's some kind of dark secret buried in these games. But regardless, this message really doesn't carry much weight. Every level starts you with exactly 3 lives. If you run out of lives, you're asked if you wish to continue. But regardless of if you say yes or no, you're kicked back to the title screen. The trick being that if you say yes and start a new game, you start on the level that you were last on. Levels 9 and 10 also have additional paddles on them, which you cannot control, but other than that, nothing much noteworthy happens. When you reach the end of the 10th level, it does this. Wait a minute, weren't we warned about death awaiting us? We just go back to the title screen and that's it? But see, here's the thing, if you watch Ross's Game Dungeon video about these games, you're going to find the ending to the first Bitbop is a little more... frightening. But what happened there is not happening here. I mean, am I doing something wrong? Well, just to be certain, I played through the game... um... a few more times. And even with all of this footage synchronized, they all just say, you win, and then boot me back to the title screen. Even this one down in the corner, which is pertinent because that specific recording was from a deathless run, as in not losing a single life on any screen from the start to the end, which given the inconsistency of the hit detection took me nearly three hours to pull off even though you can beat this game in well under ten minutes normally. In any case, I couldn't get Bitbop 1 to reveal anything more sinister than its vague warning and after playing the blasted thing for over four hours I kinda never want to see it again, so let's move on. So, now to dive into the sequel, Bitbop 2. Right away we've got a massive upgrade to the graphics, we have proper mouse control, and the hit detection, while still not perfect, is at least consistent, which is way more than can be said for the hit detection in the first game. Also, if you go into the game's setup options, you can choose your game speed. Normal, just a tad slower, kind of sluggish, or fastest. And since the gameplay is much more consistent, we have a means to measure the difference in speed between these settings. To do this, we're just going to measure how long it takes to beat the second level of the game on all speed settings, using the normal setting as the 100% mark. Now true, the ball direction is random at the start of every level, but it always starts bottom center, and the second level is symmetrical, so the time taken should be the same regardless of which way the ball goes first. Now, curiously, I expected these results to be a little less arbitrary, but as we can see, just a tad slower is roughly two-thirds of the normal speed, kind of sluggish is about half the normal speed, while fastest is a massive boost in speed, nearly double of the normal rate. Now, I actually found the normal speed to be slightly faster than I'd prefer, so I decided to play the game and Bitbop 3 on the tad slower setting. Now, the gameplay itself mostly revolves around numbered blocks, which need to be hit X number of times to take them out, with the main trick being that some levels also include a special face block, which, if hit, increments the hit count on all blocks by one up to a maximum of six hits, which is represented by a question mark. Now, it's actually possible for blocks to have more than six hits on them, but they can only start that way. The face blocks cannot increase them beyond six hits. Still, because the face blocks are a thing, oftentimes to clear a level, you have to find a way to get the ball into a repeatable pattern, which is very easy to do because, once again, the ball can only move at 45 degree angles. But this time we have an extra gimmick to help keep things interesting. Bullets. And yes, the bullets are as chunky as the ball and paddle. 
Basically, clicking the mouse button lets us fire a bullet, but the bullet doesn't actually do any damage. Instead, it acts as a solid surface for the ball to bounce off of, thus allowing you to change its trajectory. Now, you do have to be careful though, because it's very common to hit the ball with the bullet, be completely unprepared for the change in trajectory, and subsequently lose the ball. And unlike in the first Bitbop game, there are no continues here. Run out of lives and you start all over. But this game's not messing around. When we reach level 11, we're immediately greeted by a black and white teddy bear. Which seems completely harmless at first, until you realize I'm messing with the footage. This is what it normally looks like. Yeah, glowing red eyes. That's not ominous in the slightest, is it? Actually, another thing that's going on is that every time you start a new game, this red ghost ball thing makes a quip of some sort, and it has a lot of different quips. 20 in this game, and the third game has 19 new ones and one repeat from this one. Now, curiously, there's also 20 levels in both games, so I get the impression that maybe it was supposed to give a quip on every level originally, but instead ultimately just became a single random message for every new game you start. And I should mention, most of the things this ghost ball says are surprisingly antagonistic. So yeah, that's a thing. Then we come up to level 17. Now up to this point, these games have been a little dark, but nothing unconscionable. But if we fast forward to the end game credits, we see that there's an odd mention of a picture of a screaming man in level 17 from a quote, experimental film called Sweet Pickles. Well, it turns out by screaming man, what they actually meant was man's face covered with and surrounded by his own blood. Yeah, in the interest of good taste, I am not showing that one on screen. I mean, really, how the hell does something like this show up in this kind of game? Well, the story behind this seems to be relatively benign, believe it or not. Now, firstly, the guy portrayed in this photo, one Jerry Silverman, is still very much alive and left a comment on Ross's Game Dungeon video a while back telling the story of how this ended up in the game. Basically, he and the author of Bitbop were friends, so it was really just a friends being friends sort of gesture. And even though they all considered the movie they made experimental, it really was a work of fiction, since if it wasn't, Jerry here would have been dead in a pool of his own blood from accidental self-inflicted harm. And last I checked, dead people can't leave YouTube comments. This is pretty much where the darkness ends though, believe it or not, as we're done here and now we're moving on to the final game. The Bitbop 3 is pretty much a reskin of Bitbop 2, with completely different levels and a few extra gimmicks thrown in, plus the paddle looks a little different now too. Oh yeah, the gimmicks. Bitbop 2 had a bit of this going on as well, but some levels have gimmicks to them, which you have to account for in order to win. Though Bitbop 3 definitely has some of the more evil gimmicks of the two games. For instance, here on level 16, every hit of a face could potentially be increasing the number of hits you need to clear the level by 21. Here on level 17, hitting the back wall has the same effect as hitting a face. And level 18 has a teleportation effect between the left and right walls, which causes the paddle to temporarily stop moving during the teleportation. So it's good to plan ahead for the ball's movement here. Though the one thing Bitbop 3 has going for it is more story. Every five levels you get a story segment where the ruler of the entire universe, who also happens to be the game's author, can be witnessed trying to undergo a propaganda campaign to convince the general population that his butt is not tiny, while at the same time leaving his talking dogs to try and secure his position against her intrusion. It's incredibly silly, especially when contrasted to where we just came from. I mean, Bitbop 1 goes in for a cryptic scare, Bitbop 2 flat out goes for graphic death, while Bitbop 3 is just like cute dogs and tiny butts lol. Although, thinking about it, there is one dark secret we still need to address about the Bitbop games, which has actually been staring us in the face the entire time in all three of them. In fact, let me put all three games on screen right now. Can you see what it is that's inherently wrong with these games? These are all technically breakout clones without scoring. No high score tables, no scores, period. These games are intentionally built to do absolutely nothing but waste your time with no way to track your progress outside of winning or losing. As far as breakout clones are concerned, that's just really freaking weird. 
Overall, the Bitbop games are interesting, but not something I really recommend going out of your way to play. The first one especially, given how frustratingly inconsistent it is. I mean, they're worth checking out for sure, especially given that they're freeware now, but for when they came out, I don't think they would have been worth the registration price of 20 US dollars. I have 15 maybe, but probably more like 10 to 12, because quite frankly, they're not going to hold your attention for more than a single playthrough, mainly because of the lack of music, the lack of score counters, the lack of enemies, power-ups, aiming, and the reliance of gimmicks over actual skill to succeed. All three Bipop games have their own timing systems integrated, but the timing system in Bipop 1 is a little inaccurate. So for that game in particular, I recommend a cycle setting in DOSBox of 1000. For the other two Bipop games, you can safely leave cycle set to auto without issue. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. This is actually going to be the last proper ADG episode of the year, as two weeks from now, on Saturday, November 20th, I'm doing a filler video to give an update on the state of everything, given that this year has actually been extremely rough for me personally, and I want to let everyone know what's been going on and what to expect for 2022. So be sure to stay tuned to stay in the loop. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small random set of you guys.